Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Now, we've been doing these Wednesday night Bible studies for a long time, and uh, recently we started studying the book of Romans, and now we've worked our way up to uh, Romans chapter 9. Uh, if, if you have not seen all the previous Bible studies uh, that we've done on these Wednesday nights, I, I, I hope you will go back to the playlist and, and catch up and watch them all. I think there's something in each one of these studies that uh, uh, you will enjoy and it, it will be a benefit to you. Um, but this particular study uh, on the book of Romans, uh, it's really, really very important. Uh, I hope you will go watch it from the beginning, particularly in this book, because the introduction we did to the book lays a foundation that is, is really essential. You get that foundation right as you continue reading the book, because if you're not reading it in the proper context, you're going to miss a lot and, and possibly even come to some uh, horribly wrong conclusions. Uh, now, uh, now that we're in Romans chapter 9, uh, it's especially important uh, to get this one right. And uh, so I hope you'll go back and watch last Wednesday's uh, Bible study. Uh, we did the first 13 verses of Romans chapter 9. So you really need to get watch that. It's, it's, I just can't emphasize it enough how important it is. Uh, before we get into the subject matter, though, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps to say hi and introduce yourself. If someone doesn't know Brother Cripps, uh, I hope you'll subscribe to his channel. Brother, tell them what you're doing. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live, which comes on every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we have a panel of uh, lovely people uh, that we get together and try to stand in the gap between believers and unbelievers and um, bring people to the table with inclusion uh, so that they get a chance to hear the gospel and to hear uh, questions from uh, a self-confessed atheist uh, who asks believers questions, and we try to answer them for him, and we all uh, try to learn from the process. So it's a very interesting show, uh, and um, you're more than welcome to come and give a listen if you haven't heard yet before. Um, I'm also part of this uh, channel, uh, Church of the Eternal Secure, the Wednesday edition, and as we do the Bible studies, and it has been um, absolutely edifying and has helped me in my walk to take this uh, extra uh, study into all these uh, scriptures, and um, I, I just uh, can't tell you how delighted I am to continue to do that, so I'm grateful to Brother Luke for uh, invite me on. I think I started out as uh, kind of a fill-in, and then it worked so well that he invited me to come on uh, on regular. So um, I'm very glad to be here uh, for that. I'm also uh, on a channel on Saturday. Um, uh, my brother, uh, brother Steve, who's been on this particular broadcast as well, um, uh, Soldier for Christ, we are at war. I think he's working on getting a shorter name for the channel. That comes on Saturday night. Uh, usually around 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it deals uh, mainly just with spiritual warfare. So if you uh, uh, want to come over there and give us a listen on that one as well. And on Talking Doctrine, Matthias' channel, I'm on there every Monday on Monday's Milk. And um, I, I uh, fill in uh, other times on a few other shows. But that's about it. And, uh, yeah, that's all I have for now. So I'm glad to be here, and I um, uh, can't wait to continue to study Romans. Thank you very much. And hello to everyone in the chat room. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you are not familiar with uh, Brother Cripps' channel, uh, I hope you will subscribe to it and, and uh, see what he has to offer. I think you'll find it fascinating. Um Okay, uh, you mentioned Brother Steve. I'm going to send him the links, Control V. Uh, I didn't talk to him in advance, uh, so he's probably not even aware or looking for it. Right. But if he gets the links, and if he is available, we'll ask him to join us uh, because um, I can't say for sure that Renee is going to be with us because I have not heard anything from her yet to confirm. I assume always that she's got her standing 
uh, schedule an appointment with us on Wednesdays, but since she hasn't responded back to me, I don't know for sure. So we're going to continue the two of us, and then we'll see if uh, Brother Steve or Sister Renee uh, join us or not. But okay, enough of the. Uh, uh, hey, Brother Hendricks. Hey, I'm, I'm always thankful Brother Hendricks is here because I count on him probably more so than anybody else to uh, to be the moderator that really uh, exercises great discernment how to deal with these people in the chat room. He does a fantastic job, let me add. Yeah, yeah, he does. Yeah. So, Brother Hendricks, we, we appreciate you being here and helping in that way. Okay, so now let's start. Uh, we, we got through Romans chapter uh, 9, verses 1 through 13 last week. But I think something that's worth repeating mm -hmm. uh, is this theme here. Uh, so let me let me go back to the beginning of my notes here and just reread this one theme here so that you have these thoughts in mind, okay? Yes, sir. Um, uh, Romans chapter 9 is primarily misused and abused by Calvinists. And that's why this is so important. I want everybody to understand chapter 9 in the proper context, in the historical context, the way that it was intended by the Apostle Paul, not the way Calvin has, has interpreted it, uh, because it leads to horrible, uh, uh, evil philosophy of Calvinism if you don't get this right. So um, the real purpose of chapter 9 uh, is it's not about individual personal salvation. This chapter is, is about God's sovereign right to choose, uh, elect um, individuals uh, throughout history. He's chosen particular individuals to use for a purpose. That's what the election is, elected to serve a purpose for God, not being elected to be saved, like some are elected for salvation and some are elected for damnation. No. Uh, so th that is the context. You need to understand this. We laid a, quite a foundation on that premise uh, last week, but I will be repeating that over and over again as we continue uh, through these uh, these verses. So now let's, let's go to uh, verse 14. Uh, uh, verse 14. Okay. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Mm. Okay, brother, I, I don't know if I'm even being fair to you asking you to comment on this before I, I re reference the Old mm -hmm. Testament verses this is, uh, to explain this, but go ahead and just give me your opening thoughts on these th three verses, please. Sure, no problem. Thank you. So verse 14, what should we say then uh, is a righteous, unrighteousness with God? Uh, of course not. Uh, God is the epitome of righteousness. He sets the standard for righteousness. That, that That's the thing that none of us can come by unless we come by way of him. Uh, there, there's no way for us to be righteous. In fact, as we've said many times on this broadcast, our righteousness is as filthy rags, which we get right from Scripture. So we're we're taking the imputed righteousness of Christ onto ourselves as a, as a freely given gift. Um, verse 15, uh, for he saith to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. It is God's prerogative to give mercy to anyone. We do not deserve mercy. What we deserve is uh, eternal separation from him. We deserve all the punishment for all the sins that we've committed in this life. Uh, but fortunately for us, he's given us the gift. Uh, he gave a son to us to pay the price for sin. And that is the, one of the greatest mercies and greatest compassions that we can ever imagine, um, especially if you're at the point of realizing how uh, detrimental or how needy we are when it comes to righteousness. We're not able to produce that in and of ourselves. It is God that gives, us, uh, gives that to us as a free gift. And again, it's his prerogative who he does that uh, with. 
uh, verse 16. So then it's not of him that willeth. This is extremely important. It is not about our will. It is not about our will to do anything. Uh, our will is pointless when it comes to salvation. It's pointless when it comes to service. Um, it is he that does it. It is he that's done the work. We rest in him. It is his will, not our will. Um, runneth, that's about work. That's about not doing works. It's not about the works. Runneth is works to me. Um, it, it, it's about resting in Christ's finished work. It isn't about our will or about our works. Uh, and then the last point is, is pretty clear, but of God that showeth mercy, which ties into verse 15. It is his mercy that, that counts. It is his mercy that matters. And uh, it's through his compassion that he even shows us mercy because, again, we don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, uh, many of you missed the beginnings of the Roman study. But uh, if, much of what we talked about earlier was about salvation. And we will talk about salvation later on, particularly when we get to chapter 11. Uh, but this chapter, as I said, and it's, it's absolutely essential, you get this right, this chapter is not about personal individual salvation. Amen. This chapter is about the nation of Israel and the individuals leading up to the nation of Israel and the genealogy of people coming through Israel until we get the Messiah from that genealogy. God's decisions as to which of these individuals this genealogy would pass through to create this, uh, the uh, a Messiah, the promised one. Hi, Brother Steve. Welcome, sir. He, he, he's there, but he won't talk to us. <laughs> I think he's getting situated. I'm, I'm glad he's glad he showed up. He must yeah. have uh, seen your link and and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Very come good. Through. We very haven't good. gone over much, so uh, it would be easy for him to comment on those three verses. I think. As yeah. Well. Yeah. I think what I'm going to do, though, before I ask him to comment, I'm going to give you the context um, that I'd like you to uh, apply, uh, because, uh, as I said, the context is not personal, individual salvation here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, we, if we if we think that's what this is talking about, you can go horribly wrong. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, um, so, Brother Steve, speak up when you're ready. Uh, and otherwise, I'll I'll just continue. Oh. He's having problems. He'll be back. Yeah, some technical issue, but I'll, yeah, I'm sure yeah. he'll join us back again right away. Uh, okay, so here is the, the context. Okay, uh, uh, now when I read verse 16. And I put these three verses together because it's they had to be uh, part of the same um, discussion. Mm -hmm. Grouping, yeah. Uh, but uh, in verse 16, it says, So then it, and what you, you, I don't know if you noticed, but as I read it the first time, I did emphasize the word it, and it wasn't accidental. Mm -hmm. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a tiny little word, it. Yeah. But it's super, super important that we go and ask ourselves, what, what do you mean it? What mm -hmm. is it you're referring to? Mm -hmm. Okay. If we don't know what it is, you can come to a bad conclusion here. Uh, so, um, and, and this particular thing, whatever it is, it's not of being of your will. It's not of your race, your efforts, mm -hmm. okay? Whatever this is, is totally up to God, not, not anything about us, okay? But that's not salvation. That's the Calvinist view of salvation. Right. So it's not up to the individual. God chooses. You have nothing to say about it. You, you may not even want to ever have anything to do with Christ, but, but if God forces it upon you, or, he, or you may want to, but he won't allow it. That's Calvinism. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Steve? You back? Uh, let's see if you're you got it working this time. Are you there? Yo, there he is. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, I know that I caught you off guard, I, and it's because I expected Renee to be with us, but she's been incommunicado, and so uh, because I didn't know if she was coming, I had to wait for the last minute to to send you that link. But so th I'm glad you're available and can join us. 
Um, were you able to hear anything we've said so far? No, I, I wasn't. Okay, so we are <laughs> we are in Romans chapter nine. We just read verses 14, 15, and 16. Uh, I put them up in the private chat space, but I posted them before you joined, so I don't think you can see them there. That's uh, okay. But, uh, I'm looking at them on the Bible app. So. Okay. Okay, so the question is, uh, I asked Brother uh, Cripps for his thoughts on these verses, and he explained uh, his thoughts. And, and then I said, uh, before I have you, Steve, uh, amplify your thoughts on those verses, uh, I want to give you the context that we need to use because the people are continue to be wrong when they use make the context personal salvation. Uh, it's this chapter has nothing to do with personal salvation. It's entirely about God's sovereign right to choose whoever He wants to use in the genealogy to create the nation of Israel and can get create the Messiah. Okay? Yes, that's all. It's all this uh, chapter is about, and God is sovereign in making those choices who he's going to use uh so when we read these three verses here and i read the six verse 16 and i said so then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of god that showeth mercy well here's you know it two letter word we, we just skip skip right over it most of the time not stopping to think, well, what do you mean by it? What is it? What is it referring to? Okay. Uh, and, and that's the, that's, what's going to make this make sense or not defining what that word it is. So I'm going to say that, um, it, uh, it refers to God's choice to use Israel, uh, electing them to become a nation. And, and I'm going to go back to, uh, let's, let me post this for you here in the private chat space. Exodus 33, 19. Let me put it in the chat room so you can see it. Oh, actually, I'll, I'll post uh, three verses here for you. Uh, uh, let me put it in the private chat space for you two first. I won't be able to see that there. Oh, oh yeah, you won't see it. But uh, okay, I'll tell you what it is. Let's start off. Uh, okay, Exodus. 33:19. I assume you got a Bible there, Brother Steve. So look that up. Exodus 33:19. It says, "And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy." Does that sound familiar at all? Do those yeah. words strike a familiar chord at all? Yeah, and it sounds a lot like uh, salvation. <laughs> it sounds a lot like what Paul just wrote in chapters 9. Yeah, yeah, it does, because he's. Uh, this is my personal take that Paul also says, uh, and, and, uh, either Paul or Peter, one of the two, but I think it's Paul that says, you know, Moses and 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 the Red Sea and all that stuff, in Israel, that happened was given to us as, a, as an example or an example for us to be able to understand these things. And, it, you know, that verse in Exodus, pass before thee, sounds a lot like pass over thee. In other words, pass over, which is uh, another example of salvation that is not earned. That okay. it is God who showeth mercy. I gotta, I gotta stop you because you're taking, us, <laughs> you're taking us in a direction that I don't want to go, because, <laughs> because I don't, I don't think that is really the intended uh, point that's being made here. Uh, last week's study, uh, I don't know if you saw it, Steve, but uh, Brother Cripps, you can remember that right over I, and I, over I, again. Okay. The, the words that Paul used in the first 13 chapters over and over again, I went to the Old Testament and found the exact same words. So right. Paul is not giving us any new idea or original words. Paul right. is quoting. Paul is quoting Old Testament. And right. if you want to know what he's referring to, we have to go back to the original statements and find out what were they talking about. And it's oh, not I agree. Personal, it's not personal salvation. However, well, I, I, 
a lot of times uh, there are, I don't know if it's fair to call it a similitude or something or a picture or something. Uh, we can, we can get a, uh, a, a message out of it that, that, that can be uh, beautiful. And maybe it's even correct, uh, 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 you know, adduct doctrinally in some cases, but it was not the intention at the time of the writer, the Old Testament. It was not the intention of the person quoting it in the New Testament. Okay. So if you're going to get find out the real meaning behind what's being said, the intended yes. message, we need to uh, think of it in that context. Well, I, I and I, I, I totally and completely understand that, and I would... I would preface my answer by saying this, using Jesus' words, which was also quoted, I think, by one of the other writers of the New Testament, that, you know, the, the volume of the book is written of me, said Jesus. So the entire point of the Old Testament was Jesus. Mm -hmm. So when Paul quotes these things, he's pointing you back to the Old Testament to point you to Jesus who is the author and finisher of our salvation. See, yeah. I understand all this chapter and all of Romans to be about it's Jesus and not of you. So when it says it is not of him that willeth, but of, and not of him, but of God that showeth mercy, sounds a lot like Romans chapter 4. For he that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness because he's not running. He's okay. not willing it. All right. So it's God who shows mercy. And I'll, I understand that, that there's a Calvinistic view of this scripture that says, well, God just chooses on whom he's going to have mercy and some he'll have mercy on and some he won't. <laughs> but it's clear from the entire context of Scripture, especially with some real simple verses, like you always say, go to the clear verses first. Okay, wait, wait the a second. The ones that, wait, that, wait a second. that say it clearly, like Steve, Jesus Steve, said. Steve, look, we're all, we're all, Steve, we're all in agreement on the gospel. Right. This chapter is not about the gospel, and that's not what I want the subject to be tonight. The point okay. I'm trying to prove in studying chapter nine is that it is not about personal salvation and showing the context and, and showing that Paul is actually quoting the old Testament and to find out what he means, we have to go to the old Testament, even though you can draw kind of uh, pictures and shadows from a lot of things. That's not where I want to go with this now. So let me continue on uh, the next, the next, I, verse I, don't, that, I guess I would need to know exactly where you're trying to go because I don't understand because I mean, it, 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 it you know, um, I think Paul's whole, I mean, this is just my understanding that Paul is always trying to show that it's not of works. It's of grace. It's of yeah. God's grace, you know, and yeah, when he's talking about individual salvation, but this is the point you're, tr you're foiling right now. The premise I laid for the entire chapter and my, my point that I want to make everybody understand that it's not about personal salvation. And now you're trying to bring it, make it, make it <laughs> well, about that. So let's, let's I, just stop that. I'm, and a, let me, I'm let me trying go on to, to what understand I, what you mean, because I, I don't understand, I, I, you know. Um, well, just listen for a while then. Just okay. listen. Okay. All right. Um, now, um, now, this mercy that we're talking about uh, here in, in Exodus 33, 19, uh, it says, uh, will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will be show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And uh, back in... Uh, um, uh, the uh, Roman portion, it says, uh, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will compassion on whom I have compassion. So uh, it's, it's clear Paul is quoting that. So we need to find out what it refers to when he says it in uh, verse 16. So I cited verse 33, 19 to, to show that he, it's being it's a quote. 
That's the important thing we need to understand. Now let's go to uh, verse, chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity on the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So here in the same uh, book, Exodus, we can see that, that uh, it's telling us that God's condition for mercy at that time, and this is not about salvation. This is about, uh, in the Old Testament, keeping the commandments was not a means of gaining salvation. Keeping the commandments was the means of being blessed. And, and uh, so it says in verse 6, he shows mercy unto thousands of them that love me. So the condition to get mercy in this context in Exodus is you love God and you keep his commandments. Now, we know that's not required for uh, individual salvation, but that was required for Israel uh, to be blessed, to receive blessings. Uh, if we want to know what the uh, uh, there's a there's a rule in the Bible. If you want to not sure about something, then just keep reading. So I'm going to jump ahead just for a second. And, and, and in Romans chapter 11, is Paul here. He's no longer talking about nations and genealogies when you get to chapter 11. But now he's talking about personal salvation. 1132 says, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So here, it's a totally different context being discussed. Personal salvation, and now mercy is available to all. But what Paul's doing in chapter 9 is talking about the genealogy, the people he used to create the nation and for the Messiah to come from a particular Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse. That was all prophesied, God's choice of each individual to be used until we get Jesus and so in chapter 9, it's about genealogies and the, and the nation of Israel, how he would create it and use it. Uh, and that criteria uh, for the mercy is how well they love him and how well they follow the commandments. So now that we've, we've discussed those points there, um, Brother Cripps, uh, I'll give you another chance to, to uh, talk about those three verses. Uh, in a way, I felt when I asked you to give your thoughts on him in the beginning, it might not be fair without getting the context of finding out what the quotes were talking about. Oh, sure. I I, I think that the way I describe him is, is, is still accurate. It's not that it's not accurate. But I, I want to go to this point that you're trying to do, which is to say that he's quoting uh, uh, Moses. That's why you brought up the Exodus scriptures. Um, he's making the point uh, even even finer in the verses that we're talking about now and relating them back to what he said. So the only difference between the two is the word gracious instead of compassion. Uh, but it but it can can mean similar things. Being gracious towards someone and being compassionate towards someone is is similar. Uh, where mercy is the same. Um, so I don't think I would change what I said. Uh, based on the new edition and, and going back and pointing it out. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, keep it there. But I do want to add that it is absolutely um, helpful when, when um, people in the New Testament are quoting the Old Testament to make sure and, um, and state that and bring up the original verses like uh, you're doing, Brother Luke, um, because a lot of people have taken these verses out of context um, in the past and try to make them into something that they're not. And so this is a way to, to shore up your argument um, as, as uh, you're, you're trying to do and saying that it's not about personal salvation, uh, but it's about uh, the genealogies. And, and, and uh, truthfully, Steve wasn't here last week, so I don't think he had the benefit of, of uh, kind of knowing uh, what, the, what the purpose was and pointing all that out. Um, so that's all. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm gonna. I posted some more verses in the private chat space uh, that you can see, Brother Cripps. So we'll we'll move on now to the next verses. Uh, let me read a little further. Um, 
for okay here I am. verse 17 for the scripture saith unto pharaoh even for this same purpose have i raised thee up that i might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth okay well let me get your thoughts just on that point here before we continue any further here just because we're now we're in a totally different subject uh we're, now we're talking about pharaoh before he talked about remember i love esau i mean love jacob i hate, hate esau yes remember? sir yep. but, but now he's talking about it he's referring back to another event in the old testament dealing with pharaoh so we're yep. going to have to go back and and look at this what's going on with pharaoh in the old testament but first before i do just give me your thoughts on verse 17 there yes sir so verse 17 this is a good example um and and we can go up to the verse we just read about having mercy on whom we have mercy and compassion on whom we have compassion and he's stating to pharaoh here that it, that uh that god is the reason why he's even in that position of power in the first place that he might show his power in thee in pharaoh show his power in pharaoh and that god's name not pharaoh's name god's name would be declared throughout the whole earth and in fact um he's just called he's just called pharaoh in the in this verse i mean his, his you know that's just the position it's not even talking about his name all the things that God did in uh, Egypt at that time, God is remembered. God is the focus of all that thing. And I think that's what is being said here, uh, uh, bringing it up in this in this fashion and saying that this is all about God's power, power. Again, God's choice to be merciful or gracious. Also, God's choice to put someone in a place of power so that his, his name might be declared throughout the whole earth. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to read one more verse and then ask Steve to talk about 17 and 18. Because, look, the problem that we're entering into right now, last time we talked about the problem of Esau and Jacob, and, 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 and Calvinists will say that, well, see, God chose them even before they're born, who's going to be saved and who won't be saved. And that's how they misapply those verses. And when you look at last week's study and go to the context, you see that's not what I was talking about at all. But now we're talking about Pharaoh and what's happening with Pharaoh and his hardening of his heart. So, see, the, the Calvinists are going to use those verses to try to support Calvinism that, that uh, God is forcing people to do things and uh, we don't have any free will and God's going to. Um, so, but go ahead, uh, Steve, uh, verse. Oh, did I read? I didn't read verse 18, did I? Or did I? Not yet. No, you didn't read. No. Verse 18. Therefore, have he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will hardeneth. So now the kind of contrast is having mercy or hardening. Okay, go ahead, Brother Steve. <laughs> well, um, okay. So I guess I understand the, the context that, that you're looking at. And, and I, I think that that with these kinds of verses and even this chapter and even looking back, there are onion layers to, to, to each thing. So yes, with that particular um, passage from before, it, it, it's very much following in line the same thing here. Um, and, and that God having mercy that there, there was, you know, uh, earthbound you know um the 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 land issues with god showing mercy or not showing mercy he did have a law system in place for earth earthly consequences or earthly blessings he said choose you this day you know um blessing or cursing life or death and and i think that's it, with with the context that, that you're talking about that's true but but i also think that the larger point is it's still paul saying that because if we understand mercy in in the you know we we define grace as one thing and mercy as another you know grace is getting what you don't deserve mercy is not getting what you do deserve 
And I think, at least my understanding of the broad scheme that Paul seems to always be writing about is that that it's any blessing, any gift, including salvation, comes from God. <laughs> and even if it's a, a, you know, salvation is not earned by any merit, and even if you have some blessing because you're walking with God and, and you're trying to live upright and righteous and God gives you mercy by giving you blessing, it's still not earned. It, um, and, and uh, you know, I, I was trying to come against the Calvinistic thing. It's not that God chooses somebody for salvation. I think with the with the Pharaoh part, that was that that is a a a purpose calling to something as opposed to um, God deciding salvation or not for for people. Okay, I'm think, glad you, you said know, that. I'm going to stop you so that we can get okay. everybody get a turn here. But they, uh, sure. when you said the word purpose, uh, before I have Brother Cripps uh, talk about 17 18 together, I want uh -huh. to reread it, but I listen to as I read this. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee. This is the context here that he's talking again about how God will, has, throughout history, Paul's referencing back to all these old char character people, I mean, Old Testament people and Old Testament events. And he's giving us a history lesson, how God used certain people and a certain nation to accomplish something. And, uh, and so in this case, he's talking about how God uh, for the, for, had a purpose in raising up Pharaoh for to show his power. Okay, so Brother Cripps, 17, 18, any, anything on those two verses before I continue on? So there, Brother Cripps? Yeah, sorry. I already answered uh, about 17. The only thing I didn't comment on is 18. Um, but uh, there's nothing to add except for he's saying hard, hardeneth, which we know already from study of Scripture that God uh, did harden Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's heart, but it was in reference to the way that Pharaoh was dealing with everything. And it's the same way that when we continue in sin, our hearts are hardened. And God does have the power to soften a person's heart. He can make a heart of stone into flesh. We know that. But if a person continues in their willful sin and the way that they walk in their life, like Pharaoh has done here again and again and again, he does allow that to happen. We are going to uh, reconsider this idea of does God harden Pharaoh's heart? Uh, I'm going to give you some things to think about. I'm not trying to tell you one way or the other now, but but I, you might be surprised. But I love being surprised, Brother Luke. Let I'm, me it, go on. Okay, so after <laughs> verse 18, uh, God um, also, you know, he know, he has foreknowledge. So God knew how Pharaoh was going to respond. You know, all the things that Pharaoh did, being hard-hearted and stubborn and resisting the God of, of uh, Israel and uh, uh, God, that's no surprise to God. God already knew in advance. He knew uh, how he's going to respond. So verse uh, Exodus 9, 16 says, and in very deed, oh, let me read this. Uh, 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 let me uh, give you the verses I forgot, guys. Uh, Exodus 9, 16, uh, Exodus 3, 19, and um, Exodus 5, 2. Let me post them here. We'll see. Gosh, Steve, I'm sorry. You got to look them all up in your Bible there. I can't go that fast on, on the Bible app. Uh, so, yeah, I wish, I wish we could see this uh, private chat space here. So, uh, yeah, if I was on my laptop, I could, but I, it's not available on, on the phone. All right. So. so, again, we're going back to the Old Testament. See, look. Um, there are many times, Brother Steve, um, 
in, in a way, you're not wrong at all. The points you're making, in uh, in that uh, we we can find Jesus everywhere. We can find the gospel everywhere, uh, and that's it's good to to be able to identify all these pictures and things that oh, man, a lot of times Renee's come up with some really good things recently uh, that uh, pro probably surprise people. They're beautiful. The end, and, and as we go on year after year studying more revelations, oh man, I never saw that before. That's another picture of Jesus. But one of the things we have to understand as we study the Bible, the initial thing we need to look at is what was the intention of the writer? What is the writer trying to get across to us when he wrote it? And so that's why since Paul's quoting, you know, uh, Jacob and Esau and those events and now Pharaoh and those events, we, we can go back and, and find out the quotes and the context of what he's referring to to get a, the meaning of what he's trying to get across to us. So um, now let me see. It says uh, verse. Um, okay. Uh, verse uh, nine, Exodus 9, 16. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up for to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared through all the earth. Now again, uh, let me see. Uh, didn't he say that? Let me see. Uh, for the same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee. I mean, it's almost a word for word quote that Paul is giving us in Romans 9.17 compared to Exodus 9.16. And now we go to Rome, Exodus 3.19. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. So God is saying, I'm sure of it. I mean, God's through the, going through the motions. Uh, he knows the outcome of each of these steps, and how, there's a whole series of events in this account. It's a wonderful, fantastic uh, record in the Bible of this, but but everything that happens, one thing after another, there's no surprise to God. Exodus 3.19 says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. So if that's the case, why did God give one thing after another, after another, after, when if he was already sure he wasn't going to let him go? And he said, no, not by a mighty hand. And then Exodus 5, 2 says, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So here we see, uh, there. The, if we go through the whole thing, you'd find out that uh, Pharaoh has already given two chances to, to repent. Uh, but... Now, after two chances, this is when God hardens the heart, if he does. That's it. still not, I'm not still decided on that. But in Exodus 7, 13, I didn't post that, did I? Let me post that for you, Brother Cripps. Control C, Exodus 7, 13. Uh, control E, enter. Okay, Exodus 7, 13 tells us, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart that he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Okay. So, um, based upon, let me add that, Brother brother Cripps, um, based upon the context now of, of the, uh, seeing what Paul is actually quoting here and what, what it's referencing, and that first of all, God knew in advance what how Pharaoh was going to react to each one of these things. And uh, he let it play out that way anyway. And then only after the, a couple of things happened, did does it say in, in Exodus 7, 13, at this point, God hardens his heart. So let me get your thoughts on that, Brother Cripps, and, and then Brother Steve. Yeah, absolutely. So it's similar to what I already said and the way that he deals with people in general. If you continue uh, over a period of time with rejecting God again and again, especially in a situation where he's calling out to someone, um, it, by the very act of uh, not listening to him and not harking to the voice, then the heart is hardened. Uh, he, I, I, he, his foreknowledge of what would happen is always going to be there. God, as we know, knows everything, and that's where the Calvinists get it all twisted. They, they take the foreknowledge as if God is somehow choosing which people are going to be believers and which people aren't going to be believers. 
And that's where they make a, a, a mistake. We all have free will. If we continue with our free will to deny God, that's when the heart is hardened. And it's, it's no different for Pharaoh. Um, yes, God knew that Pharaoh would not let the people go. He still gave him an opportunity. What does that say? What does that say about the God still gives us an opportunity? Um, his foreknowledge doesn't change the, the fact that he gives us uh, space to repent. Uh, it's the same thing uh, uh, about giving um, uh, entire cities uh, space to repent, but they would not. Um, you know, just because God knows the end from the beginning, it doesn't mean that he still doesn't give people a chance to respond. I believe that uh, the the Jewish people, when Christ came, they were being given a chance to respond to the Savior, to see him as Messiah. And that if they had done that, um, it, it, it may have played out differently. But God knew because of his foreknowledge, he knew that they would not receive Jesus as Messiah. Therefore, he did everything uh, that he needed to do to bring that about. And thank God he did. Okay. Brother Steve, uh, the Roman verses and then the uh, Exodus verses uh, we referred to. Give me your thoughts on that. Okay. Um, well, my, my number, well, about three or four things that that came to mind when you're reading them. Number one, even beforehand, was the knowledge that, uh, well, let, let, let me preface this by saying the, if you don't understand the Old Testament and haven't really read the Old Testament, especially the things pertaining like this, especially the, the Exodus story, the New Testament will not make as much sense to you, especially some of the more obscure books like Hebrews. It will almost be closed off to you if you don't under, haven't read the Old Testament. <laughs> so like and and with what you're saying what is what is the writer trying to write and what was the time period like what was happening then all those things are exceptionally important to understanding the bible better um but uh pharaoh's heart was already hard against god for so for to say something was hardened generally implies that it was already hard before it wasn't soft uh, so and and we know that because of his treatment of the israelites in general um secondly because i have a habit of looking for for jesus everywhere i, I it, it, understanding the whole story of the israelites is awesome in that sense and that um whose name would be declared in all the earth. Well, to me, that would be the Savior's name, the, the Messiah, the, the one who saves with his mighty hand that no other mighty hand could save. Because um, God said there, nay, you know, uh, he will not let them go, not even by a, a mighty hand. He did not say would not let them go by my mighty hand. Which, would, which is a clear distinction um, because he did save them by his mighty hand. <laughs> and that's why I, I think that's what, you know, uh, the whole thing with the story of the, of the Israelites. And uh, the other thing with, with all this, that, that if, if you look at Israel and all of Israel being being liberated, being, you know, being set free by a Messiah. All of them were saved. So if we, you know, were to apply that picture to John 3.16, the whole world, and then look at Hebrews, the ones that did not enter into the promised land did not enter in because of unbelief, but they still, en they still were saved initially by God's mercy, like we talk about, all have been forgiven, but not all have received it. But um, with all that said, Pharaoh's heart heart was hardened. And um, a lot of times in scripture, God has an enemy to fight. And there's always there seems to always be 
especially in the story of the cross and Israel, there was a betrayer or someone coming against God, coming against God's people, coming against the Messiah. And in this instance was Moses. And so, but God showed his mighty hand that his name would be declared throughout all the earth. And I think that's a specific reference to the Messiah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, um, uh, when you said that the uh, Pharaoh's heart was already hardened, uh, that's a very uh, good point. And, uh, I've always felt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give everybody two things to think about now and consider. Uh, one is, let's say, Brother Cripps, let's say that you and I have, uh, are having a, a dialogue or some kind of interaction, and I do something with no intention of harming you or no intention of, uh, of uh, or hurt, uh, hurting your feelings or anything else, but you're offended by it. And uh, now, and, and then I, as we talk and dialogue, I, I, the next thing I do or say, you're, you get even more offended. Now, let me ask you something. As you got offended and your, let's say your, your heart was hardened as, your, as this is happening, am I hardening your heart? All I'm doing is just uh, you know, saying or doing some things that are not intended to harden your heart at all, but you, that's the way you're reacting to it. Correct. You're hurting your own heart just because of the way you're acting to me. I'm not, I'm not intending to harden your heart. It's just right. your response to it is your heart and heart is hardening. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the way I've always felt that God's not hardening His heart. It's just that's the way He's responding to God. He's hardening His heart. So you can say God's hardening His heart only because God is doing certain things that cause His heart to be hardened. But right. it's not because God's hardening it, it's because Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's responding incorrectly to it. Yeah. That's that's the point, that one point. But here's Well another... said. Thank you. Uh, that's what I think, too. Yeah. But here's another point that I learned as I'm preparing for this chapter. The last month, I've been really look, looking into this. And here's something that I was not aware of, and I don't know what to think about it, so I'll, I'll ask it in the form of a question. Um the, in these verses here, when it says harden, the word harden, uh, there's a, a word that's in the original word is chazak. Uh, I don't know Hebrew, so I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's spelled C-H-A-Z-A-Q, chazak. That's the word that's translated as harden. And But the interesting thing is that that, that, that word appears numerous other places. And, in, and, and it's never translated as hardened anyplace else. It's always translated as strengthened. Only in this uh, uh, Exodus here, when we find it here, is Chazak translated as hardened rather than strengthened. So it makes you wonder why. Why do they translate it strengthened everywhere except there? Uh, I, you know, the person I got this idea from and learned this point from, they say, I wonder why. Well, they suspect that it, it's the, the, the translators, whoever did the translating, maybe they had an agenda in choosing to translate that particular way. Maybe their agenda was, oh, God hardened his heart. So you see, you have no control. God makes all the decisions. God's sovereign. So it sounds like maybe Calvinists or at work here in the translation is is what they are implying from the, the where I got this information. So uh, I don't know if you've never heard that before. Just give me your thoughts on that. I'm sorry. Uh, were you talking to me or to Steve? Uh, I asked you first. If you're not uh, ready, I'll go to Steve, though. Yeah, go ahead and ask Steve. I'm going to read what you just put up. Okay. All right, Steve. Uh, Re-ask the question if you want. <laughs> uh, uh, the did, short did, version, I got most did, of did, what did you, you were saying. Uh, did you follow the point I made about the word Chazak? Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Um, so if Chazak is translated <laughs> strengthened everywhere else, but only in this portion with Pharaoh is it translated hardened, 
maybe someone could be suspicious thinking why why are they translating it differently in, in this case it could be an agenda of someone trying to show sovereignty of god in uh, calvinist interpretation it, it could be or i mean uh i don't know if there's any modifiers from the hebrew or i mean the greek um to to show like negatively strengthened now <clears throat> i was thinking about steel Steel was ne steel is never soft to begin with. So when you strengthen steel, you harden it. So and and you know you, you don't go backwards with steel. You can't like uh, take steel and make it softer, but by uh, the mighty hand of God, divine miracle. Um, and, and with your point that you're making before about, you know, uh, the fact that Pharaoh, um, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart was already hard against God to begin with. And so it's, you know, and not that, that Pharaoh, that God hardened his heart specifically before he did these things, but as God came to him, he got in saying, let my people go, or I'm going to do this. Just the very fact that someone was coming to him and basically, you know, you have somebody in a, in a position of power like that, that is full of themselves and prideful. How dare anybody come against me and tell me what to do? And so <clears throat> most people that are like that, just get more prideful it's you know uh, and the so i think the case could be made that his hardness of heart just like steel was strengthened into being harder steel yet you know when you when you strengthen steel it becomes harder i think that kind of would uh, amplify your point of of strengthened when you strengthen well, the, steel, it becomes yeah. harder. The The point with the word Shazak in the translation I thought was interesting, but I'm not really sure what to conclude. Uh, but I do think that my conclusion today uh, is the same as it was many years ago when I was trying to understand this hardening of his heart. And I, I explained it earlier, and you both seem to think that that was the right way to understand it, that God is not hardening his heart. God is just doing certain things, and, and heart, Pharaoh's hardening his own heart because of the way he's reacting to God. So I believe right. that's the right way to understand it. Now, I'll, I'll move on in to the next portion here. I agree. Yeah. So now we get to Romans 9, 19 through 22. And again, before I go on, I repeat this. I cannot repeat this enough. This chapter is not about personal salvation. It's about God's use of Israel. So you have to understand it through that lens. If you're reading it through the lens of personal salvation, then you're going to easily come to the conclusion that the Calvinists do. See, this is, this is why Calvinism exists, Romans chapter 9, because they uh, try to apply it to, they interpret it as salvation, and then it, what it does, it makes God into a monster. Uh, and, uh, but it's not intended to be taken that way. It's a history lesson. Paul's telling us about events in the Old Testament and how, how that, what that means to us in terms of God uh, exercising his sovereign ability to, to choose people for a purpose. Amen. Not, not salvation. So uh, chapter 9, verse 19, Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth ye find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Uh, brother Yaval, we, we're going to notice, again, a lot of question marks here. Uh, Paul's using these questions here. Uh, uh, it's just his technique of asking a lot of questions. And verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Uh, now, uh, I, uh, I have a note here to myself that the answer to this question is based upon something we're going to find in Jeremiah chapter 18. So we'll go there. But before I do, uh, oh, let me read a couple more verses so we get more context here, because this is the real problem. 
This is the real problem, maybe more so than even the Isaac Esau problem, and that is this clay, okay? Hath not the potter power over the clay of this same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that his wrath, uh, oh, that's my own notes there. Uh, okay, so that portion of scripture here is the part of the clay. But again, how many people know that Paul's account of the potter and the clay is not an original thought by Paul. This is the thing I hope will open everybody's eyes about Romans chapter 9. Probably half of the verses in Romans 9 or more are not Paul's words or thoughts. He's quoting over and over again Old Testament accounts. So if we don't go back to the Old Testament to find the context, then you're going you're gonna to come to horribly wrong conclusions. So, uh, well, let me ask you, Brother Cripps, first, uh, on those verses I read, just give me your initial thoughts, and then we'll go to look at the Old Testament and see what it, it's talking about. Okay, I, I still feel like Paul is doing a great job of setting this all up to make a, a greater point later. Um, so earlier when he's saying, you know, the verse about I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and uh, compassion on whom I'll have compassion, he's saying, again, as I said at the beginning, it's God's prerogative. Uh, in that way. And then uh, talking about Pharaoh, talking about the uh, the way that Pharaoh was reacting to letting Israel go, that of course he's not going to let him go. God knew that. So that's the, that's the foreknowledge there. Um, so then back to this point again about uh, the, the man that God made saying, why have you made me like this? Um, how many times have we done? How, how many times have we asked God, you know, why, why, uh, did you do this? Why did you do this to me? Why are you allowing me to go through this? Um, I think it's a natural response for a human to ask God. Um, but um, these verses that Paul is using are, are again, making a point that it, it's going to be explained, especially when we look at the, at the uh, Old Testament, which I'm sure is what Luke's uh, headed here uh, to do. Um, so we see the same thing. Uh, all throughout Romans, Paul used the same patterns again and uh, again. Um, and going back to Old Testament scripture, the people that were hearing this at, at, at that time, any one of them that spent any time studying scripture would know that Paul was doing this. And they would see the reason why he was doing it. And, and um, uh, they may not understand it. And that's why he's going to such lengths in order to explain it and also for us to understand it. How the Calvinists get it all confused, I, I'll never know. Um, I suppose if you if you look at Scripture from a Calvinist perspective, then that's where the problem lies, and you're not you're not taking things in context uh, in context like uh, like we're trying to do here, and going back to the original verses and showing that Paul is uh, simply quoting, as Brother Luke just said, uh, quoting uh, the Old Testament. So it's going to become clear. All right, uh, Brother Steve, before I go to Jeremiah, what, what's your initial thoughts on it? Um, I hear both Job and Jeremiah here is my initial thought. And I, I agree with Jason in that, you know, why tell a story or why rehash a story of the Old Testament if you're not going to be using that to further a larger point and um uh again i i you know uh, i don't think paul is in any way stating some kind of Cal calvinistic thought here at all uh, but that uh, you know ephesians 2 8 and 9 that's i mean if i could sum up all this into one into two sentences it'd be, it would be Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that, that we're saved by grace 
anything that is a blessing and and all that comes from God. God has power over all of us, you know, um, just like, you know, he said to Job, did you make the, 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 the stars? Were you there when I set the foundations of the world? Were, were, who are you that you can question me? Um, kind of a, kind of a thing. And that Paul's in some sense setting up this idea that, if God wants to do the saving, he can do it however he wants because he's God. And it's not up to us to, to um, question how he saves or who he saves. But that, you know, that th there's two things that pop right out to me and with the whole mercy thing is that it, you know, faith. Faith is how we please God. Faith is how we um, receive salvation. It's not of us, but it's of God, you know. Let me, um, let, me, uh, let, me, yeah. uh, let me say something about your your idea about God saves, is free to save whoever he wants, but I think that's not exactly how you said it, but uh, God doesn't choose who he saves and who he wants. It's set in stone that God saves everybody who believes. That's the condition. That's the only, that's the determining factor. So the idea of God uh, is, is free to choose who he saves right. who doesn't is. is, is that's what I'm, well, that's what I'm saying is that he chose to save those that would believe on Christ alone yeah. without, without works, without any merit of our own Israel wasn't saved from Pharaoh because of what they did. Israel was saved from Pharaoh mm -hmm. uh, because of what God did. Mm -hmm. okay, that's that's me, uh, my, I think, the overarching theme to me. Okay, so you're, uh, you are you mentioned uh, uh, something like, I think you said big picture or something. Uh, it goes back to the big picture. I forgot how you phrased it, but, but uh, or, uh, and, th and then I'm going to take us all back to, verse six for just a second here because verse six is something that people skip right over without ever asking what's he talking about okay and we talked about it in great extent last bible study but i'll, I'll, I'll reintroduce the idea again paul says not as though the word of god hath taken none effect okay now if you watch last week's buddy bible study you'll see how this uh fits in with the earlier verses and stuff but the point here is that Paul goes on, to, he, he talks about how um, God would use Abraham and, and, and Sarah and, and, and uh, Isaac rather than uh, uh, Esau and, and, and J Jacob and, and, and all these people that he's choosing to, okay, not that person, but that person, not this person, but that person. And, and then and, and for the purpose of creating this nation and this genealogy to bring the Messiah. Paul is, is giving, that's really what he's saying here. Uh, but then he says, and he used, he created his nation Israel. And he gave Israel the scriptures, all the prophets, and even the Messiah came from them. And yet, almost no Israelites are believers. So, Again, verse six says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. The, I, I think Paul's actually uh, answering the question. Well, the Jews will say, well, if Jesus is the Messiah for, the, it promised to Israel, why is hardly any Israelites believe? Come on. If he was the savior, the, the real one, all of Israel is going to believe in him instead of a tiny little fraction. And so did God make a mistake by using Israel to bring the Messiah? Because Israel's rejected him. The whole world's going to accept him, but Israel rejects him. So maybe God made a mistake even used in Israel. But no, it's not. It's not, uh, as Paul says here, uh, it's not as though the word of God has taken none effect. That's really what that's referencing there. So that's the, that's the, the arching theme that you're referring to, Steve, that you, if you need an overarching theme, that's the theme, the in introduction of what Paul's bringing in at the beginning of the chapter that he's trying to clarify here. 
Uh, now let's right. let me move on to, uh, I'm going to move on to say this one thing before we go to Jeremiah. These verses we just read about the potter and the clay and the honor and dishonor and uh, stuff. It, again, uh, it, it's not talking about uh, this wrath here. It, it says, uh, with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. This wrath is not referencing the wrath of people in hell. Okay. Don't, don't think it's talking about wrath for people in hell. Now you're talking about being saved or lost. It's talking about the, the uh, how God will deal with the nation of Israel. Okay. And we'll see that when we go here. Uh, now we're at Jeremiah 18 verses three through 10. Oh, uh, I did. Did I post that brother Cripps or not? Uh, I don't see it. I see. Uh, okay, okay. Let me post it in our private spot. Thank you. Thank you. It's always yeah. helpful to me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Gosh, I wish Steve could see this. It would be real helpful if you could read along. Yeah, Steve, don't, do you have a laptop? Huh? I, I do, but when I join these, typically I'm driving. Yeah. So well, I can't look at my laptop while driving. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we are. <laughs> This is Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 3 through 10. So I hope everybody, if you don't have this in front of you, take notes, and then you can go back and read all these verses on your own to see. Uh, I'm giving you the actual quotes here. Uh, okay. So uh, now in this portion of Scripture, this will show God's flexibility and willingness to deal with Israel based on their repentance. Okay. Uh, and it, it says in verse 3, then I went down to the potter's house. Whoa, whoa a second. It sounds familiar. Potter. Okay, I think I heard Paul talk about the potter. I love this scripture. Yeah. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel. Okay, now I'm raising my voice for a reason, people. Just to hope you get it. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Okay, I'm not going to go, I could go further, but I will come back to Jeremiah. But just that portion right there, okay? First of all, we have him, we find out what Paul's talking about, the potter story. Again, people, please. All these stories are not original Paul stories. He hasn't told us one original story. Everything he's referencing is an Old Testament story, a real story, a true story, a historical account of events and people. And that's where you have to go back and find out, okay, let me look at when that happened, what he's talking about. And lo and behold, we found the exact words and quotes that he's referring to. So now we can get an idea of what's he mean? What's he really talking about? And then we see here, he says, it's, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? So are you mine, O house of Israel? Okay, uh, Brother Cripps? Yep, that makes it pretty clear who he's talking about. <laughs> um, I'm glad you did say it in that uh, volume to try to make the point because um, we seem to be getting it here, but yet so many people don't get it. So you're pointing out exactly as I said you would do in going back to um, the Old Testament and showing who exactly Paul's talking about. He's talking about Israel. Again, it's not about personal salvation that the Calvinists make it all about. It's uh, about uh, God not being done with Israel. So I would add to the point, too, in talking about the story of the potter, can God not can God not deal with the house of Israel the way that he wants to deal with it, just like the potter deals with the clay? The answer to that is yes. And we know, historically speaking and pro prophetically speaking, that God is not done with Israel yet. There are still things that are in place, for, uh, planned before the beginning of time, 
for us and also for the house of Israel. And this is what he's talking about here. And uh, yeah, it's important to be emphatic on that. Uh, Brother Luke, you did a fantastic job. Thank you. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, now, okay, Steve, uh, with the, the context of the Old Testament, seeing what he's talking about with his story about the potter and the clay, give me your feedback. Steve-o. Oh, oh, <laughs> I was muted and I didn't realize it. I figure that's why I said Steve-o, because usually you're right on, <clears throat> right on top of things. You talk a little slow sometimes, but um, yeah, that's... <laughs> that was a little too slow. That was a little too slow, Steve. <laughs> um, so... Uh, um. I guess I, I, I mean, I see the overarching, I, I see the story uh, being told, but for me, that scripture in Jeremiah, and this is like one of the things that like really needs to be understood. Not only does it obliterate Calvinism, it also obliterates, um, what's, what's the other one? Uh, dispensationalism. If you're talking about Paul being the, 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 the dispenser of grace for the church age. And why is Paul using Old Testament scripture back to back to back to back to back, like Jeremiah, which to me is a, one of the most clear verses about salvation in yes. the Old Testament besides Isaiah. Behold, the clay, it was marred in the hands of the potter, <clears throat> and he made it the same piece of clay that was marred marred by sin, made it again another. So he took the same piece of clay that was marred and made it, it again into another thing without changing the clay. And, and so, you know, that's both a, 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 a national promise to the, to the nation of Israel, but I also believe it's a personal uh, promise to each person, just like, if you take Israel and you and you place it as an example of the world, and then each individual inside Israel, as each person, uh, you know, in in uh, in in a, from an individualistic standpoint, <clears throat> how uh, how Christ died for the whole world and the the law that was given to Israel, blessing or cursing, and and. We know from Hebrews that they entered not into the promised land uh, for because of unbelief. So the whole nation of Israel was saved, but only those that entered into the promised land entered in because of belief. And so it was those people that were made again another, not the whole world, but just uh, like you mentioned, verse six, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Because we are Israel in Christ, because there's neither Greek, male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek. We are all one in Christ. So those that just because you're born out of the out of the nation lineage of Israel doesn't make you a true Israelite because you didn't believe. That's that, but I love that verse in Jeremiah. That's, I mean, one of the most beautiful pictures of God of us believing and God making us brand new. Okay, thank uh, you. Let's go. Uh, the, uh, the the problem with this account and the, and Paul's recount uh, of this uh, uh, Jeremiah. Again, Paul's recant, give a, a recount of that account in, in, in Jeremiah, is that when we see that, uh, let me see. Um, the story of the potter and the clay, uh, why hast thou made me thus? Okay, and, uh, and then um, a making, a, a, 
pot, the potter making clay, the the Calvinists will take this and say, you have no choice in the matter at all. You have no free will. God will make you into a saved person or make you for destruction. That is the point that has to be addressed because in Romans 9, this is the foundational chapter of Calvinism. And problem is, because they don't understand this chapter and make it about personal salvation instead of uh, you know, the nation of Israel, uh, that they're forced to, once they come to that conclusion, they're forced to go through the rest of the Bible and redefine numerous words that we like to use to show that, no, everybody can get saved. The word whosoever, the word all, the word world. Calvinists have to totally redefine words that everybody knows the meaning, but they have to redefine them because of their conclusion on this chapter. So uh, if they under if they don't change the meaning of those words, those words refute the conclusion they came to about chapter nine, and that's the point I, I'm trying to drive home in this cheat chapter uh, teaching on this chapter. Mm -hmm. But here's the uh, uh, here's the thing uh, back in let me see when it said um, uh, if in let me see. Where is it? Where did it say if? Could I make one point real quick? No, because uh, I got to okay. keep my train of thought. You can come back because I don't want to take me off another direction right now. I got to find this word if. Uh, yeah, yeah okay. Steve. Okay, so here it says. Uh, why hast thou made me thus? Okay, answer is based on obedience, if in Romans. Okay. Uh, okay. Verse 20 says, what if God, uh, what if God, willing to show his wrath, to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? Uh, okay, so we know that is that the word if uh let me see i think it was earlier pardon me hmm. all right let me just go on here uh, Okay, let's go to uh, Jeremiah eighteen three through ten now. Uh, what what exactly? I mean, you can't find the specific reference you're looking for, but what was the says, purpose? Uh, uh, yeah, what if the word if is is pertaining to something we're going to go to next in Romans eight in Jeremiah eighteen three through ten. So let me read that now. Okay, then I went down to the potter's house, and behold. He wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. I know I said that before, but I, uh, I wanted to get back to context here. And it, so it's talking about Israel. And Paul is referencing back to this. So we need to understand Paul is talking about Israel. Now we go to verse 7. And he says, uh, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy? If that nation, oh, I forgot to post this for you, Brother Cripps. Let me post it. Uh, no, I've got it. It's in there. Oh, okay. Yes, sir. Okay, so here, in this portion of Scripture, it shows you Paul's talking about a nation. I mean, uh, Jeremiah, and therefore Paul's also talking about the nation. He says, I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull out, pull down, and to destroy. 
So he's talking about God's sovereign ability to raise up a, a nation in Israel and or to destroy the nation of Israel if he wants, if it's not serving his purpose. He's not talking about destroying some people in hell, burning them in hell because he just, you know, uh, he didn't choose them. Uh, verse 8, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And we know salvation is not based upon repenting and changing, but this, the way he's dealing with the nation and these individuals that he's choosing to use, it is based upon that. He says, uh, if that nation against whom I've pronounced turned from their evil ways. So if Eve, Israel gets evil and is not pleasing God anymore, well, he says they can repent, they can change. And then God, God will repent. Verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. Verse 10, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So uh, the, my note to myself here is, is, is notice it, if used twice, therefore it's conditional. So how he's going to deal with this nation and this wrath that is talking about, Paul's talking about, and that uh, Jeremiah is talking about here, this wrath is conditional upon how the nation does. And, uh, and so this is not salvation because salvation is not conditioned upon our good or bad deeds. Um, all right, so Brother Cripps, uh, I think I got that, that if straight now, finally. My yeah. notes confuse me a little bit there. Yeah, no problem. Um, it, I, I don't think it's a problem to have gone over that uh, verse again to uh, bring up the Jeremiah 7 through 10 uh, one. I think they tie in nicely together, so uh, no problem. Um, okay, so the first example that pops into mind as you're talking and going over these verses is, of course, uh, Nineveh. So uh, there are examples that God uses throughout Scripture to bring the same point across uh, in talking about him having uh, two plans that are based on the the uh, the uh, word if, so Nineveh, as we as we know, or you may not know, uh, uh, the prophet Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and he um, uh, talked about the the idea that God was going to destroy them if they didn't turn from their wicked ways. So what happened? They turned from their wicked ways, and God repented of the. Uh, of the idea of destroying them. It was based on their their behavior. And again, Israel was afforded these same chances with prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet that went to preach to them, to tell them, turn away from your wickedness, take down the the altars in the mountains and the, in, in the grassy places, take them down and turn back to me. How many times did God uh, give Israel a chance to turn? And the Israel is the clay that that God made, in, and God is the potter, and he gave them chances. How long will his uh, wrath, how long will he um, uh, forsake the wrath that's fitted for them? And, and in terms of Israel, he will take it all the way up to the end. Prophetically speaking, he'll take it all the way up to the end with Israel and give them one final chance to see that the Messiah that was sent to them was indeed their Messiah. His, his long suffering for Israel goes on and on, guys. So he chose them as his people, and he's never forsaken them, uh, and his plan for them is not over. And so in making the point that these verses that Paul's talking about is not personal salvation, he's talking about Israel. That point is being made crystal clear, at least tonight. So I think it was uh, worth it, uh, Brother Luke, to go back over it again uh, to make the point that you're making here with the uh, 18, 3 through 10 from Jeremiah. All right. Thank you. I'm glad that was helpful, but I'm going to let me re re recount a few things here, just emphasizing key words. And again, remember, almost every verse in Romans 9 now we find out is a quote from Exodus, we had some earlier in the last week from Genesis, and then we got Jeremiah. These are quotes. And when we go back and read the quotes of what they're actually talking about, what is he talking about here? Okay. Uh, 
and it says, uh, uh, let me count these. Let me just reference them. It says, uh, O house of Israel, okay? O house, house of Israel, I speak concerning a nation. If that nation, I speak concerning a nation. So over and over again in these verses that Paul is referencing, we see that the context is the nation of Israel. How will God deal with the nation of Israel? All right, Steve? Yes, I completely agree that God is talking about the, the nation of Israel. I point out a, another if passage, Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, and I think this verse illustrates the difference between uh you know a, a an eternal life um grace and mercy and and a temporal earth bound uh mercy if if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and and pray and turn from their wicked ways then i will hear from heaven and heal their land not talking it's talking land it's talking nation land um and so there's a vast difference between between <laughs> these types of promises and, and you know the healing the land or the opposite of god pouring his wrath out on the nation or their land um and one of the things uh that's important to remember when we're talking about this wrath being poured out on Pharaoh or the nation of Israel, but on, on Pharaoh was that this was 400 years in the making for them to get to this place of God pouring his wrath out on Egypt for the sake of Israel, because they cried out to God finally. They thought they had it good for a while in Egypt. And then they got slowly but surely sold themselves into slavery to Egypt and abandoned God in that. And finally, finally, they cried out to God. And what did he do? He poured out wrath on Egypt and on, on Pharaoh specifically, who... who when you start out the journey there, a new Pharaoh came in that did not believe in God, did not know God, neither acknowledged him as God. That's where it starts out with that new Pharaoh. The one prior did trust and believe in God. The one that was that put Joseph as his number two. You know, so that's important to remember that the new Pharaoh didn't believe in God at all, didn't acknowledge him as God in anything. And from the time that they went with with uh, Joseph and his brothers and all of Israel starting to move into Egypt, you know, that 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 started from, uh, you know, God, God having a hand in there. And then 400 years later, you have this happened where they had sold themselves into slavery to Pharaoh and God hearing their cry and God delivering them. And, you know, so God pouring wrath out on Egypt. So it's basically, why are we questioning? I think Paul's saying, you know, why are we questioning this, this happening here? Um, why, but I think, you know, that, that whole aspect of how long of a time frame it took for God to to get to where he poured out the wrath to save the nation. And it wasn't until they cried out to him. But and I think that's all part and parcel. But the if if then thing we only see in scripture applied to uh, earthbound temporal uh, blessings or consequences. Just like in the life of a believer, you know, he chastises his children. Okay. Uh, 
one last point here, and then we'll kind of finish up everything here. Uh, um, look at Jeremiah 19, 1. Uh, I mean, 19, uh, let me see, what is this? I guess it's 1, 10, 11, and um, 1, 10, 11, it says, uh, Thus saith the Lord, Go and get a potter's earthen bottle, and take of the ancients of the people, and of the ancients of the priests. Then shalt thou break the bottle in the sight of the men that go with thee, and shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel, that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury them in Tophet, till there be no place to bury. So uh, another example of uh, using uh, the word potter, this example, this, this picture that, that the Lord gives us uh, of the potter and the clay and, and, and to, to explain to us how God will deal with the nation of Israel or any other group of pe nation of people. Uh, so, uh, you know, last week and this week, we there's an awful lot in this chapter. Uh, at, there's one problem verse or portion of verses, and then another one, and then another one. They're, they're not a problem if you say, well, if you just do a little research and say, uh, look up a verse and find out, wait a second. It says that that's in the Old Testament. Go back and you find out that Paul's quoting the Old Testament in almost all these verses in this chapter. And so the first rule of Bible study is context and, and uh, the intention of the writer. What point is the writer tr intending to get across to us? And to understand the intention of Paul here, we cannot just uh, uh, neg uh, ignore it and, and, and put in a philosophy of Calvinism and bring that to the table and insert that in and make the verses ap apply to your philosophy that this is talking about man being man's salvation and that God chooses and he'll just he'll, he'll make some people for wrath and some people to be saved. And, uh, you know, he'll harden people's hearts and and and. and all these, these are things that Calvinists do with this chapter. And, but when you understand it, that has nothing to do with the, uh, the intention of the writer. Uh, we, of course, we're not near finished with the chapter yet, but I can't, I can't stop repeating that point enough. Um, so uh, I guess it's time to uh, make a little summary here, and then uh, we'll finish up here. Uh, Brother Cripps, what, what do you think? Yes, sir. Thank you. So I think that, um, I mean, we, we took the time necessary to completely make this clear that it was uh, um, the mechanics of these uh, verses were about Israel. And I think that using the Old Testament was a perfect way to, to set that up and to understand that it's not about personal salvation, but it is uh, dealing with um, Israel. So um, I think it's a uh, it's a bruise on the face of the Calvinists. <laughs> I, 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 at least I think it is. Um, I don't know if any Calvinists would be swayed. I'm sure that they wouldn't be because they're pretty um, they're pretty locked into their heretical uh, standpoint. Uh, but we'll keep doing that. We'll keep refuting that. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, more of the study of the, the verses uh, moving forward to next week. And... Um, Say hello to the chat as usual and uh, pass it over to Steve. Um, I think that there's, uh, you know, obviously I think, <laughs> I think Paul is using all this to set a stage uh, to, to talk about the difference between Israel and the Gentiles um, as he shows later on in the chapter. But um, I do think it's important always to see what why what was Paul talking about in these verses, especially these obscure verses, which seem to suggest something other than uh, the clearly defined 
versus the ones that are crystal clear and easy to understand. Um, uh, and, and so I think there's a couple things that can be said here, like asking God, why was I placed in America in the, in, in 19, you know, in, in the 1980s, as opposed to being placed some other time period in some other land and some other people group. These are all the, the types of, I think, what Paul is, is driving at in some sense, you know, that God definitely has the power to place me in each place. And with Pharaoh, his you know, when you look at the difference between the two pharaohs and how Egypt was blessed because of the one that actually believed in God and and because of, you know, Joseph followed after God. Um, and then you look at the opposite of what happened with the pharaoh that did not believe in God. You see one Egypt being blessed and you see another Egypt having wrath and destruction. Um, and so because of Pharaoh and his belief, he was fitted for destruction. And the Pharaoh that uh, believed in God, his land was blessed because he believed because of what Joseph did as, as another Messiah figure. Um, and so I see this contrast between belief and unbelief uh, all throughout scripture, especially Old Testament stuff. And, and so, you know, it, God chose these people because of the condition of their heart to begin with, because they did not believe. So it was not God choosing Pharaoh ahead of time, uh, I mean, because of his foreknowledge, sure, knowing what Pharaoh would choose. But I think even then it was all pertaining to belief and unbelief. It wasn't God making him hardened. Pharaoh chose not to believe. He chose not to honor God. He chose not to. And the, the same opposite be true for the Pharaoh before who did choose to honor God who did choose to believe in, in, in God and, and to, you know, believe in the God of, of, of Joseph, so to speak. Um, and so to me, it all comes down to, you know, you have the, the, the earthly temporal blessing and cursing was based on belief and action. And then Paul goes on, I believe to show and has shown already that the overarching when it comes to personal salvation, eternal salvation, as opposed to earthbound temporal salvation, blessing and cursing, that eternal life is not of man. It's not of willing. It's not of running. It's not of our righteousness. It's not of anything we do, but, but God and us responding in belief. Um, and I think the same is true for our choices in life uh, that result in earthbound blessing or cursing. Um, and Proverbs surely shows that if you, and so does Psalms 1 1, that, you know, in general, if you walk with God, abstain from sin, and, you know, all that, that you will have a blessed existence a blessed life it may not be as blessed as others or it might be more blessed than others but um that's earthbound not eternal when it comes to eternal it's totally different um and all of those things all good gifts come from god and when god chooses to destroy the wicked it's it's because of the wicked of it's because of the choice of the wicked people to be wicked. And it took 400 years for God to destroy that, that Pharaoh, you know, that didn't believe. And his heart was already hardened to God and God, he just got harder as God tried to say, let my people go. No, they're mine. Not realizing that it was God who put him there in, in the first place. All right, thank you.
Uh, okay, uh, the remainder of chapter nine is uh, is not going to be near as uh, difficult as the this uh, first twenty two verses. Uh, but there's a lot, still a lot of interesting stuff to, left. Uh, we might get through that remainder of that and even be able to move into chapter 10 a little bit next Wednesday. So we'll see how fast we, we go through that or slowly. But uh, all right. So uh, chat room, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, being there. And uh, I absolutely had to ignore you and I couldn't pay attention to anything. I hope it went well in the chat room, but I had to focus on this. It required a lot of concentration to uh, try to make these points. I, I, I really, the, this, uh, this, oh, this chapter here has, has bothered me for many years as the way that it's twisted and, and, and abused because I've, I've said this over and over again, Calvinism is the most evil philosophy. It's the greatest assault against God I've ever seen. It makes our God of lo love, mercy, and justice into an uh, evil, sadistic cruel lottery player and uh uh and the only the only sinner is actually god in calvinism man's only an innocent puppet that god uses and makes do the most horrible things uh that i cannot i cannot uh stand so uh that's why this chapter is so important to me because i know their whole philosophy is is based upon uh teaching this chapter incorrectly uh, so, okay, Steve, thank you for being there uh, uh, on the spot or uh, even though without any advance notice and filling in. And uh, Brother Cripps, uh, thanks again for joining me every Wednesday. And uh, I, don't, oh, uh, I don't have anybody scheduled for Friday night's interview. So uh, if uh, you're a regular member of the congregation and you have not been interviewed yet, I hope you'll contact me. Uh, my email is sincitypreacher at gmail.com. And we'll schedule the interview for Friday night. And it won't be painful at all. Right, Brother Cripps? Yes, absolutely. It won't be painful at all. Um, I listen to all the interviews because they. Uh, I, I like that they get to the bottom of some other aspects of who people are. And I would, um, I would say that Brother Luke is extremely gentle. And you can go and listen to any of the interviews to kind of see how painless it actually is. And I would encourage people to do that, especially listen to brother Luke's uh, interview uh, done by brother Mark. That was fantastic. So uh, brother Luke showed uh, in my opinion, he showed that he put himself under the same scrutiny that uh, he puts other people through. So I think it worked out great actually. All right. Thank you. And uh, might as well get brother Steve's thoughts on it since he's also been in interviewed by me. Yes, it was terrible. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was it was no problem at all. And uh, thank you for having me again. And uh, sorry, chat room. I also could not uh, look at the chat room. But hey, everybody, God bless. All right. Thanks everybody for participating, and and uh, we're all blessed with this congregation, this ability to come together and study the word and, and praise and love our great savior, God, Jesus.